God, no. That's one of my dreams. I was one of those guys on the hoses. It was in New Maya, New Caledonia. Several transports were unloading munitions when, boom, the whole dock goes up. Sabotage? Accident? Who knows? I was on a ship whose duty it was to fight fires and perform salvage work. The Navy was divided into two parts, one consisting of battleships, cruisers, and other fighting ships, and the other part called the Auxiliary Navy, consisting of tankers, transports, and tugs, among others. We were in the Auxiliary Navy. My ship was the USS Menominee, ATF-73 Auxiliary Fleet Tug. Just so you don't get the wrong idea, the ship was 210 feet long and about 42 feet wide. It drew about 12 feet of water. There were 80 crew members at its highest complement, so while it was small, it was still a pretty good size. Going all out at flank speed, we could do about 23 knots. Usually we were bored to tears. It's really very dull when you're on board a ship with 80 other guys. This was a Saturday, a day of relaxation. I was below, lying in my bunk, reading King's Row for the umpteenth time. All of a sudden, it sounded like the aft hatch cover was dropped on the deck. The whole ship seemed to shake. No one said or did anything right then, so I kept on reading. Then we get an all hands on the aft deck. We rush up and are told to fall in. So we're all standing there when our captain walks up and introduces us to his good friend, world heavyweight champion, Gene Tunney. I gotta say, it looked like they'd had a few. The captain no sooner introduced Gene than we got a radio message to go fight a fire on the munitions dock. That was what shook the ship. An explosion, not the hatch cover. When we got to the dock, all hell had broken loose. The fire was huge, hot, and spewing exploding shells and bullets all over the place. The initial explosion was so severe that it blew the tops of tanks off their treads. Fire engulfed everything. There was a line of trucks that had been waiting to be loaded with ammo to take to the ammo dump in the mountains. The trucks were nothing but blackened hulls. Everything that could burn was burning. We stayed as low as we could and started toward the worst of the fire, spraying water as we went. Bullets were flying everywhere. There was no defense. It's a wonder some of us weren't killed. We fought the fire for several hours until it was under control. Then we were asked to be stretcher bearers. That meant going in and pulling dead bodies out and carrying them to the triage area where people tried to identify them. I worked on the truck drivers. They didn't have a chance. They died right in their trucks. Their skins turned to a black crust. They were completely unidentifiable. Dog tags vaporized, arms and legs burned off at the elbows and the knees. As we pulled them from their trucks, you had to be careful they didn't break. I was working on one poor fellow when his head cracked open and the cooked brains fell out all over me. They weighed nothing. They were dry as toast. Light as, I don't know. All I knew is they were once people. Now they're ashes. As we rushed them back to triage, chaplains would stop us to pray over them. Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, whatever religion there was, was there. How could you tell what they were? The unspeakable horror of it. Where was my God? What had he done? Finally, it was over. Finally, we could stop and think about what we had seen and done. Thank God we were young. We didn't know any better. All the more reason to go and fight and kill Japs and be killed. But this stays with you. It's something you never forget. It doesn't get any better as you get older. Oh, the memory fades some, but it's still there. 
The time I spent in the South Pacific wasn't all bad. In fact, some very funny things happened there. I remember one guy on our ship. He was a virgin, as were many of us. He decided that now was the time. He was going to get it. In Numea, the military services maintained, unofficially of course, a house of prostitution called the Pink House. Once in a while, we could go on leave in Numea. Not that anybody would ever want to, but we could get it. Well, this guy, Greg, decided this was the time, so he went ashore. In order to buck up his courage, he purchased a fifth of island whiskey, probably the worst rot gut in the world. He took swigs of whiskey as he made his way to the pink house. This was around one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, of course, Numea is in the tropics, and the afternoons are hot as hell. When Greg got to the pink house, the line to get in stretched several blocks, but he had his whiskey for company. So he's standing in this long line of guys waiting to get in, drinking his whiskey in the afternoon heat, but the line is moving very, very slowly. So he gets drunker and drunker as he slowly inches his way to the house. Finally, around 4.30, he reaches the door, is admitted, and assigned a young lady who takes him up to her room. By this time, the whiskey is gone, and so is Greg. He can hardly stand. They undress, but Greg is as limp as a dish rag. They try everything, but it just doesn't work. So, still drunk, he has to return to the ship. Still a virgin. Maybe this isn't so funny now. Maybe it's pathetic. But we thought it was funny at the time. Poor Greg never did live it down. We didn't stay in New Caledonia forever. Seems like we hit every port in the South Pacific. Guadalcanal, Tulagi, Palau, the Philippines, New Guinea, Saipan, Tinian, New Zealand, Oahu, Okinawa, and a place I think every ship in the US Navy visited at least once, Ulithi Atoll. Ulithi was a small island surrounded by a large coral reef that made for very convenient natural anchorage. The Navy used it as a staging area. There was only one inlet into the anchorage, and that was protected by a steel webbing that could open and shut as ships entered and left theoretically keeping enemy subs out. I say theoretically because small two-man subs could sneak in under a US ship while the nets were open, and no one was the wiser. So guess what happened? That's right, one got in. They picked on tankers and ammunition ships whenever they could. They always seemed to attack the logistical ships. Anyway, one must have snuck in and they hit a tanker. The poor guys in the tanker never had a chance. Not one survivor. Not one. We were sent over to fight the fire along with the sister ship. We both nosed up to the overturned tanker. The only part out of the water was the bottom of the stern. Our sister ship sent six sailors with a hose onto the overturned ship. That got them closer to the fire, and they seemed to be more effective. Our captain refused to put any men on the sinking tanker. Suddenly, the ship righted itself. Those six guys disappeared before our very eyes. We never saw them again. Just like that. My God, let this happen. Why? There's no reason. When I was on my way overseas, I went on an old merchant marine transport that had been converted to a troop transport. It took 30 days to go from San Francisco to Noumea. Our top speed was about six knots. It was a slow trip, and there was no swimming pool. The bunks in the ship were five high in the hold. The guy assigned to the bottom bunk had to get in first, then the next guy up got in, and so on. If the person above you got in first, then there was no way you could get in. I finally gave up and slept topside on a hatch cover when it wasn't raining. After about a week out, the engine stopped dead in the water. We drifted around in the middle of the Pacific for about three or four days before they got the engines running again. That was the first time I was really scared. No telling if the Japanese were around or not. When we crossed the equator, of course we were all initiated into the secrets of the deep. 
we had to meet old man Neptune and go through a bunch of initiation rites. For a troop ship, it was quite small, about 500 sailors. But to go through the initiation, we were made to take off all our clothes except for our life jacket, which we could under no circumstances take off. Imagine 500 guys half naked running around the ship, their dongs waving in the breeze. Every time I think about it, I have to laugh to myself. I just wish someone had taken a picture of it. Okinawa. We went there a few days after the initial landings. One of our assigned duties was to escort or tow ships back to port if they had been hit by kamikazes, suicide planes. We went out once to get a destroyer that had received five kamikaze hits, two in the bridge, one forward, one midship, and one on the fantail. Miraculously, the destroyer was still afloat and was even able to maintain power. Everyone on the bridge had been killed, so one of the junior officers had to assume command. What a great job he did, bringing that ship back. They had to limp along at about three knots while we escorted them back to port. After they tied up, we tied up alongside them. They stacked their dead on the deck. They put bodies from different parts of the ship in different areas of the deck, so at least they knew where the unknown dead were on duty. By far, the largest numbers of dead came from the engine room. Those were the dead that they stacked nearest to my ship. I stood there and watched them. Watched them identify them. Some guys they brought up weren't dead. I remember one guy being carried up when he saw one of his buddies, he cried out, Joe, where were you when I needed you? Many of the bodies had been stripped of flesh by high pressure steam lines that had been cut. The superheated steam peeling flesh right off the bones. To identify the dead, they had a dentist slice the cheeks and read the teeth. It was the only means they had of identifying many of the dead. One of their crew who had survived this Holocaust came by. He had searched the ship for his best buddy and couldn't find him alive. Then he started looking at the known dead, finally the unknown dead. He walked by each body, checking their hands. He stopped by one. He had found what he was looking for. After a few words to the officer in charge, the officer knelt down and pulled a ring off the finger of the dead sailor. He gave it to the sailor who was looking for his buddy. I could see him shaking his head. As he did, he broke into tears, crying in uncontrollable fits. As did I. All these young men, what were they doing here? The question keeps ringing in my dreams. I've never forgotten it. It never ends. Never ends. I was never a hero. I never shot anyone, either in anger or in hate. I'm not sure I could have shot anyone, and I never want to find out. I suppose I was as gung-ho as the next guy when I joined up, but these experiences changed all that. These dreams have stayed with me ever since I left the Navy. Believe me, this experience takes something out of you. Every service person who has gone through such things carries them within. It becomes a yardstick against which you measure everything you do, every decision you make. Do your choices really make a difference? What's really important? Don't we all die anyway? So what's the point? These are questions everyone asks themselves, but in my case, everything paled in comparison to these experiences. Some people handle things better than other people. Some guys didn't appear to be as affected. I guess I was. 9-11 almost did me in. My dreams returned in full force. I wasn't sure I could handle it. I've never talked to anyone about this, ever. I felt I needed to do something to relieve myself of some of these feelings. This was the only way I could think of to do that. <laughs> 